Okay. Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the final computer vision in production, Soda AI Social of 2020. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce Rachel Roberts, who will be our sign language interpreter for tonight's event. Now, before we go any further, I just want to share some small announcements and updates about the Computer Vision and Production webinar uh, series. So over the last couple of months, I've also been meeting and interviewing a lot of leading computer vision professionals across Germany. And we have been starting a podcast series also to the tone of computer vision in production. So you will find from January 2020, some really interesting interviews called the Computer Vision in Production podcast show uh, by Soda AI Social. Uh, and we have guests from companies like Hensolf Ventures, Blick AI, Moon Vision, and many more. So the goal is, is that this podcast series will start to stream live in January 2021, and it will run through the 2021 calendar year. Of course, for any of those who may be interested in being a guest, or would also like to recommend any guests in the future, feel free to, to drop me a message. Now, for tonight's webinar, we have three technical speakers. Each speaker has been allocated 30 minutes for their presentation. This is to allow them time at the end to answer questions of the talk. However, if during the, the presentation you do have questions, feel free to ask them during the talk and we can answer all questions at the end. As well as this, we've also allocated an additional 20 minutes of Q&A at the end of the final talk to ensure that we do not forget anyone's questions. So for tonight's agenda, our first speaker will be Rodrigo Malin, who's going to be talking about the importance of camera and lenses selection for a computer vision engineer. She's going to be followed by Jun Li Tao, who will speak about hand detection model development. And then finally, we have Jan Zwandowski, who will speak about the do's and don'ts of delivering AI projects and the fundamentals of ideating, evaluating, and scoping AI projects. So without any further delay, I'd like to allow Rodrigo to take it over from here. So for those who don't know Rodrigo, Rodrigo is a computer vision engineer at Auto One. He has more than eight years experience developing computer vision solutions and deep learning. At Auto One, he is working on the area of body works. So it's damage detection for the automation of used cars inspection and evaluation. So from here, look, Rodrigo, if you want to take it away. Yep. Well, Antonio, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, uh, nice introduction. Uh, and yeah, um, let's get straight to the topic. I would like to talk to you guys in this occasion about uh, um, the importance of, of hardware selection in the sense of lenses, uh, cameras, and a little bit, we will be talking a little bit about uh, lightning systems, illumination systems. Why? Uh, why I decided to go through this topic? Because um, in the last few months, we have been um, trying to recruit some, some professionals in the area to join our team. And, uh, and we found that um, although there's a, a really nice expertise in uh, topics related to machine learning, deep learning, and uh, also classical computer vision in general, there's a little bit of a lack of, um, of uh, knowledge about uh, camera selection hardware selection for applications that require um, more of a control uh, environment. So um, even though nowadays the, um, the world of, of computer vision is like uh, full of, uh, of wizards, I would say really, really uh, impressive people that can make a lot of uh, contributions to the field. In the software side, there's also, uh, there are also applications at this point that really require uh, specific uh, cameras, specific lenses, specific illumination. And uh, it's also really important to, to get to know a little bit about this. So I wanted to make this uh, presentation a little bit more friendly in the sense of uh, uh, math and technical uh, stuff. So uh, let's go for it. Okay, um, I hope you guys are all watching my, my screen. So, yeah, let's get into the topic. So basically, um, 
what implies to have a good or an acceptable um, computer vision system or machine vision system? Um, basically, everything is related to the image quality, how the end result is going to be. So a successful, a successful uh, vision system means, in terms of hardware, um, basically image quality. Let's say this trade-off, this balance between the camera selection, the optics, the lighting system, and also the interface of the camera that we're going to be working with. Uh, image quality can be also translated uh, or can be reduced, so to say, to, um, to, the, to these uh, subtopics, these topics like brightness, contrast, sharpness, um, sensor and pixel size, quantum efficiency, dynamic range, um, image to noise, image to noise ratio. Um, so these are concepts um, that most of the time are related to the image sensor, but uh, nonetheless, we're gonna check how, uh, for instance, um, a sharp image or an image with a good contrast also, also depends a lot on the lagging system we're using and the optics. So first of all, let's, let's try to get into uh, what is quantum efficiency. All the, all the following slides that I'm gonna be presenting um, are actually related to, as I, as I was mentioning, to the, to the camera in this sense and, uh, and the lens, uh, I'm sorry, and the, and the sensor. So uh, if, if we put together all these all this, uh, all this topics, uh, we will see at the end that we can actually check them all, all the specifications in charts that we can easily find in the manufacturer's websites or, or so on. So what is quantum efficiency? So, or a spectral response also. Quantum efficiency is given in, in, uh, in terms of percentage. And it's basically the ability of the sensor to turn photons, incoming photons from the source of light uh, to electrons. So it's basically this, this, this uh, translation, so to speak, of how many photons uh, impact our, our sensor, our camera sensor, and how many electrons are actually produced as uh, a signal coming from the, from the photons. No? So, so, this, uh, so this ratio is what we call the quantum efficiency, of course, the higher, the better. Um, we can see here on the right-hand side um, some, some charts, some uh, uh, comparatives on, on different sensors on the market nowadays, uh, both for CMOS in global shutter and rolling shutter mode, and also for CCD. I mean, CCD, is so uh, it was like so, so low in this chart that it was not even appearing here. Um, but it's really important for an application for a computer vision engineer, it will be really important to know if the right, if the camera that we are, are, are selecting has a high uh, quantum efficiency, mainly for applications that require um, low light. This is really important because a camera with a low quantum efficiency uh, could actually lead us to a, a really poor signal at the end of the day. So, as you guys know, nowadays, uh, CMOS, um, CMOS cameras are quite more in production than CCD. One of the reasons is, be is uh, actually because of the higher sensitivity in, the, in quantum efficiency in the, in the CMOS sensors um, compared to CCD ones. Um, we can actually get more involved. We can get more, more into this topic. Uh, you can also check these links down here. Um, this this uh, presentation involves a lot of deep topics, but I don't want to get so deep into them. Just I just want to give you a, a, a an idea on on why it's important to to really um, take into consideration the 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 components, the hardware components on on our on our cameras and lenses. So another super important thing is the sensor size. It's not the same um, having a 40 megapixel um, camera in a cell phone 
than having, for instance, a five megapixel uh, image sensor in a machine in a machine vision camera. Although, at first glance, it may it may it may be kind of kind of counterintuitive. It turns out that most of the of the sensors, or most of the cameras and cell phones and IoT devices actually um, contain really small, really small um, sensor sizes. So it's really important to take this into consideration because the higher the sensor size and the higher the pixel size, the better. Why? Because as you can see in the right hand side, each one of these cells that we will be calling them photocytes. Each one of these photocytes is actually gathering the, the light and uh, the smaller these cells or the smaller these sites, the less um, valuable information we're gonna be collecting. So of course, it's, uh, it's more important to, ha to have a, um, a sensor with a large size and large pixel size. Um, yes, also, because in this sense, we are also contributing to have a, a better um, signal to noise ratio. There, there, are, there are two factors that are actually entangled in some sense. Dynamic range is also a really important topic. Um, we will be defining it as the ratio between the mean, the minimum and maximum uh, detectable light intensities, okay? And uh, maybe you have heard about this, uh, this concept so many times before, but uh, I think one important thing to mention here is that a lot of machine vision cameras are also um, able to, to modify. You can actually fine tune or, or set um, certain bit values in the ADC in the analog to digital converter of the camera. What this means, that this means that it will be not only a matter of the, of the bit depth of our, of our image. Let's say that we want to, to have an eight bit um, uh, image, for instance, uh, in grayscale, like, like you can see here in the right hand side, or let's say that uh, the camera is also capable of delivering color images via a Bayer filter or so on and so forth. It's also a matter of the ADC. So there are, uh, as I was mentioning, there are certain brands, certain brands that um, let us modify this ADC value such that we can also get a higher or a lower dynamic range depending this will depend uh totally on our application but why is it important to tune it you might think at first glance that the higher the um, the dynamic range the better well yes but it again depends on our application for instance for an optimum image quality the um, sensor bit depth should be set to a high value as we can see here in the lower uh, in the right low corner. A higher sensor bit that can improve image quality because the camera's internal image calculations are based on a higher bit depth. But if uh, our aim is to uh, get an optimal performance, we can also set the bit depth to a low value. Um, this is because the readout time of the sensor is shorter. So um, yeah. Let's try to consider these this, this points when you're uh, selecting your camera as well. And okay, so moving on a little bit to image noise, to what image noise and signal to noise ratio means. Um, out there in the market, there are a lot of, for instance, a lot of uh, cheap cameras you know, that um, at first glance, they claim to have a good performance in terms of, for instance, of, of resolution or frame rate, for instance. And, um, and if you're not an experienced person in terms of uh, camera selection, you might think that, okay, I will go with the cheaper one. It's uh, the, the intuitive way. But it turns out that 
Um, some of these cameras actually have a high, um, a low signal to noise ratio, sorry, a low. The higher the signal to noise ratio, the better. What this means, it means that at the maximum and a minimum values of, of uh, pixel saturation, what we call pixel saturation, the difference between the true signal or the true information that we want to acquire from the images and the noise, let's understand by noise everything, any kind of noise. This also implies like electrical noises. Any kind of noise you can imagine. Let's say the summation of all those noises, how this uh, overall noise will impact in our in our uh, information. So the way to calculate it is pretty easily. It's like basically it's a ratio between the, the signal and the square root of the summation of the square noise because we are basically, uh, yeah, taking into account all sort of uh, noises. So as you can see in the right hand side, there are two images of um, uh, a typical uh, industrial application. This is an under vehicle inspection system. Okay, as you can see in the upper image, these images are actually used for uh, detecting whether or not uh, a vehicle has some foreign object like, for instance, packages of drugs. In the case of my country, it's pretty common. Um, weapons, explosives, and so on. And, in the, and uh, as you can see in the comparison of these images, the one in the, in the, in the upper side is actually not so clear. It has really a lot of noises and um, even the color is not the true one. It's not the real one. In the lower image, you, you, you can see an image with a high contrast, a lot of sharpness. And uh, this is the sort of images that we uh, expect to collect when we use a, a high quality a high quality camera, the two the two images were actually produced with in the, under the same conditions. Let's say they were placed in the same exactly in the same spot, but using different cameras, and actually the same sort of the same source of lighting. So this is really important to know, like how how is the the, the impact of of the SNR and other and other topics and other features. Okay, um, next, the interface. How exactly we're gonna be um, connecting our, our camera to our computer or to our friend grabber or so on. Um, and nowadays, I would say that one of the most popular ones is the USB cameras, USB 3 mainly. And uh, why they're really popular were, uh, well, basically because they're plug and play, first of all. Um, it has become um, one of the most common standards. It's also pretty new. You can actually connect it to your laptop and you're good to go. Um, it's also a high speed interface. You don't need frame grabbers, which is a, a, really, um, a really nice feature. Uh, also, you don't you don't have a high uh, CPU load, and well, there is a usage. Um, the the one con about the US uh, the USB cameras is that the the cable length or the maximum distance you can actually connect your camera to your computer or whatever it's actually pretty short. We're talking about something in the eight to ten meters as you can see in the chart in the right hand side. Okay, so this is, in my opinion, one of the, of the yeah, not so nice things. Uh, and the second point, we have the camera link interface, which actually uh, can deliver a really high uh, data throughput. Nonetheless, you require a complex system uh, in the sense that you require a frame grabber and sometimes other sort of connectors. Uh, nonetheless, there are applications out there in the market that require line scan cameras. Uh, 
if you're not so familiar with lens scan cameras, please feel free to, to comment it in the questions box and I will be happy to uh, answer it at the end of the, of the meeting. Um, yeah, but we were talking about um, frame rates uh, higher than 1000 for typical applications of, let's say, notes or bills inspection, uh, yeah, um, newspapers and so on. Um, and then uh, we have the Gigi, the Gigi Vision interface. This is by far the fastest growing interface in the market. Me personally, I'm really, really happy with this, um, with this interface. Um, first of all, because of the simplicity, the um, flexibility of usage, um, the possible cable lengths that we can use. Just with a single cable, cat, cat six or higher, you can easily get uh, 100 meters of distance, but you can actually, uh, if you use, for instance, a repeater, or if you use, um, let's say, two or more network switches, you can, of course, grow it uh, by quite more than 100 meters. Um, the bandwidth is also, it's also nice. It's not as high as USB, but it's enough for a lot of applications, like, uh, actually, like some of the applications, uh, I have been working in the past. And uh, well, finally we have the Fireware. The Fireware interface is pretty old. Um, it actually was pretty um, popular in the, in the early 2000s. Um, but nowadays the USB 3 is the direct replacement for it. So uh, yes, yeah, so I was saying in the right hand side, you can see this chart where you're comparing all the possible interfaces. Um, here, there's also another interface. We can actually consider it another interface, uh, although it's uh, categorized inside the, the serial uh, interfaces, um, which is uh, MIPI, okay? And uh, some other variants of it for IoT devices, cell phones, and so on. Um, but well, I didn't want to get into those into that topic because um, here I I want to talk about specific applications, more industrial applications that require uh, a specific hardware. Nowadays, all of us we all have a cell phone, and most of the applications of computer vision on the edge are done with, for instance, cell phones or um, yeah, tablets and so on. In summary, here in this link down here, you can actually check a, a really, really nice uh, comparison between um, sensor models, uh, not only of, son of Sony, but also of um, um, on semiconductor and other, and other brands. And I find it really useful because you can see, for instance, here all the topics that we, we have in covering and how they are related. For instance, the pixel size here, uh, 3.45 micrometers, and how uh, the higher the pixel size, okay, the better the signal to noise ratio. For instance, 4.5 micrometers can lead you to a 44.10 decibels and how here actually is a little bit lower. So in this sort of charts, in this sort of tables, you can, you can see, uh, you can compare a lot of brands, a lot of sensor types and so on to, to see what uh, is the right choice for your application. Let's move to optics a little bit to lens selection. Optics is a huge topic, as you, as you guys know, um, but I just want to go a little bit through it. Um, it's not my intention to, to give a, a whole speech about the physics of light and whatever. It's just um, about getting to know this, this, uh, this topic. So um, these are actually, from my point of view, 
uh, a small list, a short list of the minimum topics to start with, with, uh, with lens selection. So first of all, um, we know that you rely on your computer vision uh, algorithm machinery to correct for things like distortions, scaling factors, chromatic aberration sometimes, and so on. Um, but the more the lens fits to your application, the less headaches and frustration you will have. That's, uh, that's a must, I would say. Um, sometimes we are really, really uh, struggling with, uh, with our computer vision algorithms, but sometimes the right thing to do is to uh, maybe to change the camera or the lens. Uh, why quality is important to brands, as I was mentioning before, may have the same specs, but totally different performances. Um, of course, you can go through to the math on how to calculate the right lens, depending on your working distance, depending on the horizontal or vertical field of view, and so on. But uh, the thing is that there are so many variables involved in an industrial application that at some point if you go to the through the formulas and you uh, make the hand calculations the results are not going to be actually so specific this this uh, the result of these calculations may throw you uh, certain results that actually fit to a to a variety of lenses so there's no like uh, one single right answer for 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 the hand calculations so to say so as we will see in the next slide um, a good idea is actually to use uh, some uh, some tools some free online tools um, that help you actually um, calculating these uh, these features for your lens nonetheless um, I think that calculating the minimum sensor resolution based on the smallest features you want to detect is extremely important. This is one of the of the main uh, uh, the main things to consider. For instance, in our applications uh, in in the company, because we are want, we want to detect the smallest uh, damages in 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 the vehicle's body works. So it's extremely important to, to look for the minimum sensor resolution. Otherwise, if we want to detect a, a really, really tiny scratch, uh, but it turns out that the sensor resolution is not good enough for it, then we will never see it. It might be confused with only with noise, for instance. Okay, so um, how you calculate sensor resolution? It's pretty, pretty easily the field of view uh, divided by the smallest feature. In this case, you if you don't have the entire field of view, let's say the entire area uh, of view, so to say, you can uh, actually just feed the, um, the value you have, for instance, the horizontal or the vertical field of view. And it will give you... a um, as an estimate of uh, what the minimum sensor resolution might be for your application. Okay, the same same thing for the sensor size. Um, so look at the pixel size on the sensor's data sheet and multiply it by the calculated resolution. So once you have this resolution from the previous step, you can just go to, to the tables like this one right here and um, check for the specific pixel size, sorry, for yeah, for the pixel size and multiply it by the calculated resolution. You will get what's the sensor size you, you need or, or the one that fits kind of good to your application. Once the camera is selected, you can use the sensor size to calculate the focal length, which we will see further. Uh, Really important, take your time to study all the possible variables. Um, then pick wisely a few of uh, a few lens options and don't expect first try success. It's really important. Uh, with these online tools, you can find on the internet, for instance, in uh, with these manufacturers, Basla, 
uh, and monoptics or FLIR. Um, basically, they ask you for the same for the same values. For instance, the minimum working distance, the focal length, or the or the horizontal or vertical field of view, and so on. But the reality is that these um, these online tools will give you actually a set of lenses as a result. So they will not give you, hey, you know what, this is the one and only lens that fits exactly with your application. You need to give it a try to at least two or three different lenses. Uh, sometimes to buy it if the, if the supplier don't want to lend you. Uh, just to borrow you the lens, you, you will need to buy it. But the more you constrain your possible variables, the less you need to 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 be trying with different lenses this is important some extra tips regarding um, um, lens selection um, well these are actually things that have helped me a lot during my my let's say my last eight years um, find the best trade-off between the working distance and the field of view you might have an application, for instance, I would say um, object detection. It's actually a, 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 a good uh, example um, or anything related with image recognition where if you have the lens super close to the objective, to the, to the object or to the scene, and um, you're expecting to to recognize something in the scene based on, for instance, on some uh, color or some texture. Um, when the lens has a lot of distortion and the lens is not actually a good quality lens, it may happen that uh, the cones of light at different frequencies are actually um, bouncing, so to say, in such a way that you will end up with um, with some optical aberrations, which is something you really don't want for your application. So as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, um, I would say go for a distance, for a working distance of at least twice as large as your field of view. This is um, a practical rule of thumb that will really um, help you a lot and the second your lens aperture uh, sometimes we don't um, remember that a lot of lenses have a, a, a the f number so the lens aperture is your friend use it um, a larger uh, depth of field requires a larger a larger f number and um, this is also really important because actually i have seen applications of um, object detection with super old cameras back in my country. Uh, these cameras actually don't, don't even have uh, autofocus. Um, so at some point, if the object get closer or more distant to the camera, it might get out of focus. So it's really important that if you set properly your F number, the object you are looking at in the scene will stay in focus at least for a, st for a specific depth. And this is really, really interesting uh, because uh, maybe you don't need, uh, for instance, to inspect, uh, let's say bottles or whatever in a conveyor. Maybe you don't need a, a body focal lens. You just need a lens that um, actually can be tuned in the sense of the amp number such that if the bottles are let's say, uh, bigger or smaller, um, you will have no problem because the bottle will, uh, will stay in focus no matter the, the distance to the camera. Finally, the lens performance curves are the ultimate documentation to read when you're selecting a lens. There are a lot of curves like this you may find in the documentation of the lens. From my point of view, the two most important uh, curves are the MTF and the distortion versus uh, image height. And uh, well, 
the first one here in the left hand side basically what it tells you is like um how good the lens resolve for a specific um image sensor resolution okay and uh because it's it's possible that uh when you're let's say that you have your camera and the camera has five megapixels and um so you need to select a lens for that camera but uh, when you go to the to the data sheets to the specs of that lens you will see that it says this lens is good for up to five megapixels for instance why why if the if the size of the lens for instance actually fits the the the, the mount the mounting uh, of the camera why it says that is good for five megapixels because it actually resolves for that for that uh, specific uh, resolution better in specific in specific ranges so this is really important it also um, it's also related to to the construction of the lens itself um, also in the right hand side you can see the distortion versus um, image height so this is basically how the objects will bend okay uh, so to speak how, how the objects will bend depending on the image height so yeah i think that uh, most of the guys in the audience are um, familiar with uh, lens distortions but um, a nice way to see it just in one shot is through these uh, through these plots through these uh, curves finally as we were seeing here consider uh, all three key scenarios i want to show you uh, an application uh, i was working with um, around four years ago also in the sense of uh, under vehicle inspection systems how the lightning conditions can actually change so drastically from one uh, from one place to the other um, and how the depth of field is extremely important for this sort of applications you have a fixed camera on the ground uh, on a, on a device the camera is actually looking upwards um, yes you use a fisheye lens basically that's the basic basic concept but the thing here is that an, a car that is going to be um, scanned so to say um, we're going to be stitching these images together until you get a composite image but the important thing here is that in the right hand side you see a typical compact car so the clearance between the ground and the underbody and the under structure could be something around let's say 25 35 centimeters but this same system is also capable of scanning um, uh, trailers for instance or buses and so on so of course the clearance is quite higher it can be actually uh, more than one meter so having this distance having this uh, difference between um, 20 to 30 centimeters to more than one meter and to stay in focus is actually um, it's not so easy so this is um this is the importance of at some point imagining all the possible scenarios you may find in your application um maybe here the images are not so <laughs> you cannot see in this uh, in this presentation but actually if you zoom in the lower image for instance you can see every single detail of the car so clear that you, you can even identify um each of the screws there so for for the case of detecting bombs uh, weapons or drugs this is a, a super nice thing to have last but not least um, illumination or lighting is is a really really difficult topic also because sometimes um, you just go through uh, different options and um, you don't necessarily find the right one for your application uh, in the first try 
Uh, but it's important to know what are the typical uh, lighting configurations you may find in the, in the market. Uh, Backlights are typically used for, uh, for inspection, inspection of uh, in production lines, for instance, where you need to see the, actually the, the shape, the, the silhouette of the objects. Um, also, uh, bar lights are actually for more narrow spaces or for other sorts of applications that um, require directional, directional lighting. Um, for most of, my, uh, of the applications I have been working with, diffuse light is actually the way to go. Um, of course, the, um, it's actually something somehow similar to backlight in the sense that it um, gives you a diffuse pattern, uh, but the difference is where you locate the camera. For instance, for the diffuse light here, as you can see, uh, you can even, um, yeah, uh, locate your camera in the middle because the camera is actually is going to be looking in the same direction as the as the lamp whereas in the back lights it's exactly the opposite um yeah you also have ring lights that actually help you to to get rid of of shadows in 360 degrees so this is really good when the object you want to see is actually smaller than the diameter of the ring this is a really good uh, solution for it uh, the linear lights are typically used for um, light scan, line scan cameras. Um, yeah, so you can actually be um, um, turning on and off the light, the linear lights, in accordance to, for instance, to a, um, a measuring system, a measuring device like uh, an encoder, for instance. And finally, the general purpose lights are the ones that we all know. So uh, usually this is the one we tried, uh, we tried uh, uh, the first. And then when we see that the situation is not working as expected, then we start looking for the other ones, right? Uh, but well, basically um, that's pretty much everything. That's what I wanted to, to talk about today. Uh, if you want to go uh, deeper into the topics, I strongly suggest you going to um, the Vision Campus of Basler, uh, a German company. Uh, turns out that there are a lot of really nice German, German brands in the market of uh, machine vision cameras and lenses. And uh, for everything related to, talk, to optics, I think Edmund Optics is one of the leaders in the market as well. So. I, I think this is a, also a good option. Excellent, Rodrigo, and um, absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, I know we've had a couple of questions come in, but I think, you know, presentation wise, we kind of went uh, kind of on time. So we have three questions to ask you for the Q&A session after. So everyone who has asked a question, we will come around to it um, after the final presentation. But I suppose for next carrying on, we have Jean-Li Tao. So those who don't know, Jean-Li has a PhD in computer science from the University of Auckland. Before moving into the industry, she was a researcher and a lecturer at the Auckland University of Technology. And now she's working as a computer vision engineer and machine learning engineer at Virtual Retail. So I'd like to now welcome Jean-Li uh, to begin her presentation. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, let me see. Oh, um, trying to share my screen. Okay. Somehow it doesn't. Um, got a bit of trouble, can't see my PowerPoint here. Give me a second.
no, no rush, Jean Lee. Just uh, uh, yeah, we've got you here. Yep. Good luck. Thanks. Um, hey, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, just give a little brief um, overview about my project before. So during my PhD, uh, I was working on vision-based object tracking. Um, the subjects were pedestrians, vehicles, and the fruit flies. So after submitting my thesis, I joined a short project with AUT, which is analyzing the Antarctica vegetation from videos recorded with uh, drones. After graduate, I joined Crown RTC. Um, it's a forklift company. Um, and in this research center, we develop indoor autonomous forklifts. Uh, I was focusing on 3D feature construction uh, localization and a little bit of uh, sensor fusion as well. Uh, 2019, September last year, uh, I joined uh, Virtual Retail. So VR is funded in 2016 by Ling One and Benedict Lay. Um, it got fully acquired by IFM in 2020. Uh, we have two projects going at the moment, the body measurement estimation and the IFM mate system. So the body measurement estimation is the initial project. Um, uh, we develop deep neural networks to estimate body measurements from two RGB images with height as prior. And the model contains sub segmentation, 3D reconstruction and recon <laughs> regression modules. Uh, with the online shopping getting more and more popular, um, there is actually a large portion of product got returned because of the wrong size. So this application fit right into this scenario. Um, currently, we're focusing on size recommendation. We actually work with a few partner, try to integrate our model as a back end, uh, or they can directly use our phone application. Um, this is not all, of course, you can, it's also potential being used for a customized outfit, uh, style recommendation. Um, unfortunately, today I will not talk more about this project. Um, if you do interested in using the product or, or know about this project, uh, definitely get in touch. So the IFM mate system, uh, this project we started uh, last year. Um, there are many big warehouses, uh, the manufacturing um, line have the automated process to package the product. But in the small to medium warehouses, they are still manually packing components for a product. Um, so the MAP system is developed to provide individual guidance to assist packaging work procedure. So here is a example setup of the mate system. Here is the bench. Okay, with my cursor. <laughs> this is the, the bench and then uh, the camera is mounted on top and pointing downwards. There is a monitor and its processor. So it's all uh, on edge. There's no cloud computing involved. This is a um, video showing an example case. Um, so this monitor here shows the camera view overlaid with the region of interest. Uh, this is predefined by the user. And the highlighted regions are the um, relevant uh, areas that you should pick items from. In this case, this is the cable and the manual. So um, we have a hand uh, detection running on the back end to verify whether this array is got picked. So once these two um, areas picked, um, then the next relevant areas would be highlighted. Uh, in this case, this is a label. Um, so with a different product, the the picking and packing procedure will vary. Um, if the system, when you initialize the mid system and predefine working procedure, and then this can be used to trying a, for a new packaging task. 
And also working for packaging for eight hours a day can be really tedious and prone to mistakes sometimes. So um, the system can also do a real-time alert when there is a mistake. Uh, so this can avoid rework. Um, the system is currently available. Uh, we have a, about a dozen of them deployed inside IFM. Um, for the previous two months, we tried to get external customers on board. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, next I'm going to talk about how we actually develop the hand detection model uh, as the backend for verification. The most relevant uh, research area is the 2D object detection. And one category is the regional, uh, region proposal network based methods. Foster RCNM was proposed in 2019 and here is the um, overview of the network. It's take the image as input, go through the convolution layers, it's also called an encoder. You get a feature maps and then the regional proposal network will take the feature maps and uh, predicts sparse um, proposals, basically bounding boxes. And then those proposals are combined with the feature map and um, passing through to the uh, classification and regression stage to get the final detection results. More recently, the Cascade R and uh, Dynamic RC and, and um, tried to uh, push the limit of detecting better bounding boxes, meaning have a better aligned box with the object. So uh, after the original proposal network, the RPN, um, you got sparse uh, proposals. This is I uh, denoted by those colored boxes here. And normally you will apply a intersection of union threshold um, between the prediction and the ground truth to select a subset of uh, proposals for the second stage, classification and regression. In this case, it's the green boxes that got selected. Um, if you want to have a good uh, bounding box location, uh, bounding boxes, um, then if you increase the intersection of union threshold, you will have uh, selected a better quality um, proposals for the later stage. There's a better chance for the model to learn a better quality bounding boxes. But at the beginning, the RPN is not, not performing that well. So it's only predict very sparse um, proposals and not really good quality. Um, when the training progress, uh, it, can, it, it learns, so it predicts a better uh, and more uh, proposals. So this dynamic RCAM proposed a very intuitive idea to apply a dynamic thresholding. Um, basically, it's trying to analyze how good is the current predict proposals are, if they are good quality and good amount of uh, predictions, uh, sorry, proposals, then you can increase the uh, threshold to get a better ones. It's quite a simple idea, but works quite well. Uh, here is the results. It's actually uh, works the best on the ResNet 101 deformable convolution network. Uh, but interestingly, uh, compared to the Cascade RCNA on the ResNet 101, one, it is not that much better. It's actually worse. So, but the, the Cascade RCN uh, is using a different technique. It's adding more uh, detection head is heavier as well. Um, so if you're interested in having a better quality, um, bounding boxes detected, these two papers might be interesting for you. Another interesting one is the context RCN. And, um, First of all, this is not a online uh, method. It takes the current frame and the adjacent previous and future frames as local guidance to guide the current frame detection. Um, also, it uses a long-term keyframes um, to do this guidance as well. So what's the long-term? The long-term keyframes uh, can be selected, for example, from different days, but the same time of the day, say noon time. 
And the choose of this long-term keyframe is vary from um, sequence to sequence. Um, so it's more details in the paper if you're interested. Uh, with this two, they're using the transformer uh, standard uh, attention module to combine this information to get the detection. Uh, here is the result of the uh, over three data set they tested. Um, it's a uh, it's a very large margin uh, compared to the single frame baseline. Um, but of course, this is not a fair comparison. Uh, the single frame is only have current frame, but the the context RCN using like the adjacent frame and even some frames far from the current frame. Um, if you are uh, working on analyzing offline videos and try to get good results, um, detection and with some assistance from the sparse distributed frames, this could be a framework that uh, would be really interesting for you. The original proposal based on methods is also called a two stage methods uh, because it has the original proposal stage that proposed the original of interest or the proposal, and then it's classified and uh, regress on that, um, on the second stage. Um, this don't have a fixed inference time. <laughs> so if your first stage, the proposal propose more uh, burning boxes, then it's heavier for the second stage to process. So this is what, sorry, this is one of the reason that uh, this group of method is not used for real-time application, but they have their own uh, special case use as well. Um, Anchor-based methods is also called one-stage detector. Um, here, this flow chart shows the difference. It also has the input, the backbone, uh, got the feature pyramid aggregation. And instead of uh, having a, a pro original proposal network, um, it used anchor and sliding window technique to get very dense uh, proposals for the classification and regression stage. So um, Yolo V4 is one of uh, the one stage detector and it's proposed that this year. It's actually uh, tried quite a few different techniques that was published in the past couple of years. And for instance, they used a cross stage partial connection uh, on the backbone for the darknet and restnet rest next 50. Some augmentation uh, like mix up, uh, mix cut and crop and label smoothing and also mesh activation, um, pen path aggregation. So it's test out a bunch of stuff and uh, it's a really solid paper and they did a really good ablation study. Uh, like they separate out each items, almost each of them, like to see if you're adding this in, for, in for example, the, the certain augmentation, how the performance is got improved and how much it's got improved. It's really a good paper to read, actually. Um, the scaled Yolo V4 was published two weeks ago, I think two to three weeks ago, um, and sets the new benchmark <laughs> for, for this group of method. Um, there are many devices available in the market um, from the, depend on your price range, right? If uh, generally the more expensive ones uh, have a better capacity to process faster and larger models. So if you, if the model can, uh, when you develop a model, if the mo if you can scale the model according to a certain device later, that would be a really useful uh, thing to have for industry application. So to be able to do the scaling, uh, efficient debt uh, is a specific um, compound scaling method proposed for object detection uh, framework. Um, you probably heard about efficient net, which is uh, scaling a proposed compound scaling for the backbone um, structure like you can scale the image resolution, the depth and the width of the backbone 
in, in the compound way. And the efficient debt take a step further. Instead of just a backbone, it also scales the uh, feature uh, aggregation pyramid, like the neck, it's called the neck, and also the, the prediction and uh, the classification and regression head. So the efficient debt was setting a benchmark for a long while with the largest model, uh, although it's really slow, but it's kind of performing well. And then the scaled ULU V4 um, P7 model, it runs actually slightly better than the largest model of the efficient debt, but, all, but twice as faster. So um, very interesting paper to look at. Here is the P5, P6, and P7, basically the three models here. Um, the diff it's, uh, it follows the ULO v4 uh, structure quite a bit. Um, it's still using the cross-stage partial connection in the backbone, but it's not using the darknet 53 anymore. It's changed the structure a little bit. Um, also, it applies the CSP on the feature aggregation part. Um, yeah, it's doesn't sound that complicated, right? But it's improved the performance quite a bit. So what's the CSP? Um, it is taking the convolution, uh, sorry, it takes the feature um, map and then split the channels into two parts. Um, in this case, it's half-half, and then directly pass part of it to the later stage, but the other half is going through the convolution box. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, another way, the uh, different from the, the compound scaling, they actually stack uh, modules on top to get a larger model to achieve to uh, achieve better performance. So one interesting um, experiment they did is like you trying the your data set with only the Yolo V4 P7, and then you can discard the top stack top two stack. And then you get a P5 model basically. And then this model, you train with P7 and just get rid of the top two to, to stack and apply it compared to directly trying a model P5. It's getting a better results, the better performance. Um, but of course, this is on the condition that your image re resolution is in the middle range from 400H to 800. Uh, is that, that's the image resolution we look at. So this would be quite a quite an interesting um, thing to to test out. If I could have a model, and then I can train once and discuss certain parts, and then deploy to a a more a, a device that's kind of uh, have less compressed capacity. So yeah, this is definitely a quite interesting paper and we are looking at it uh, at the moment. Uh, so the anchor-based methods um, is actually quite popular uh, in real-time application um, due to the balance of the, between the efficiency and accuracy. Um, but with the anchor-based method, uh, the objects detected are normally have the shape uh, similar to the anchor size and aspect ratio that you predefined. So this kind of is a limitation, someone say, um, that if you have a large object which don't have a corresponding anchor size defined uh, close to that size, then this object will not be detected. So the third category is anchor free method. Um, because they don't require anchor, uh, it's potentially more flexible for um, the object scale and aspect ratio. So they still have the same, you get the input image, you go through a feature pyramid, sorry, you go through the, the encoder, and then this features are passed through the feature pyramid, and then you pass through to the head. And then in the regression head, you don't have any anchors. It will directly regress from a pixel about the four distances to the image border, sorry, to the object border. Um, 
this way you don't have any um, reliance reliance on the prior defined sizes and the spec ratios. Um, two weeks ago, again, there is a very interesting repo published, NanoDebt. Um, based, this is uh, based on the, the FCOS framework and they optimized this to run on a mobile ARM CPU with a detection rate of 97. That's <laughs> crazy, 97 FPS on mobile phone. Um, definitely check that out, it's quite a cool ripple. Um, different from CFCOS, the CornerNet uh, proposed, this is actually from work, um, proposed to predict the top left corner and the bottom right corner, like this, this, and then pair these two corners based on a learned embedding to get the detection. Um, this internet is a improvement on top of corner net. It's proposed to use a, you predict also the center of the object to kind of this idea improve the performance a little bit as well. Anchor frame methods uh, are a very interesting direction. Um, but in general, the performance is not as good as anchor based methods. Um, so yeah, but, but still quite interesting. And there is actually another uh, new, in the last couple of months, um, new group of method is based on transformer. I didn't include the slides here. Um, basically people apply, you don't need convolution, well, you still need convolutions. Um, layers to get the features and then you can pass the features to the transformer to use the transformer attention to do the detection. Absolutely cool paper to read on, but uh, um, we would definitely keep an eye on that area, but I think uh, the transformer might be more suitable for lower level uh, vision task like super resolution, derain, defog, etc. Um, so after uh, selecting a model, uh, a method, um, we need to adapt uh, our data and uh, adapt the model to our data set and also for our um, use case. So transfer learning or pre-trained model it was a basic uh, technique like almost everyone use. And to, in 2019, there's a paper published Rethinking ImageNet pre-training. This paper basically saying pre-training um, actually is not helping your model to improve. It's basically help your model to converge faster. <laughs> um, we actually tried um, with without pre-training models. Um, for our case, our specific case, um, the, the, the pre-trained weights actually help both the convergence and the performance. So uh, it really depends on the application, I think. Um, for our case, because you can see we had the workbench have very relatively simple background. And with the ImageNet, um, they have very cluttered background. So with the pre-trained weights on ImageNet, um, it kind of, uh, help the feature representation part a little bit for our case. Um, secondly, we labeled our own data set and um, we actually want to have a bit more specific uh, area from the hands. So we're actually wanting to estimate where the hand is grabbed at. If you have a really tiny region of interest, uh, you want to understand the fingertips uh, area instead of just the center of the, the, the hand. So we uh, modify the, the method, the networks to the models to um, estimate the rotated rect and the waist location to roughly estimate the orientation of the hand uh, as well to get, give us a more precise location of the hand. Um, the hyperparameter tuning part is quite important for industry application uh, from my point of view. Everybody talk about overfitting is a bad thing, 
uh, it's not necessarily bad if you have a very specific case that you want to overfit to that specific case. So hyperparameter tuning is sometimes prone to overfit your model to a certain uh, direction. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's a knife with two sides, like might hurt you and might help you, but you pick, right? Uh, with the, if you have a good uh, guess about your hyperparameters and genetic, genetic model uh, algorithms are quite common to use for people to do the fine adjustment, um, especially when your parameter space is quite, I mean, when you all have a lot of parameters to estimate, like if you got augmentation, uh, learning rate, and also the post-processing part all in this bucket it quite uh, got quite a bit of the, quite a, quite a lot of them and it's not suitable to use the Bayesian optimization to do this task. Um, but if you got only a few of them that you are not quite sure about, um, then population-based training, um, Bayesian optimization could be something you could look at. Uh, we develop our model on PyTorch. Um, for t deployment and also for in for the inferencing speed purpose, we convert the model to Onyx and uh, also TensorRT, and then we deploy the, the the model. Till here, we actually finished a cycle of one model deployment. Uh, again, said we have uh, a dozen of systems uh, de delivered. Uh, in, in, in actively <laughs> tested. Um, at the meantime, we try to evolve the detection models uh, with the latest, greatest, not necessarily always the best ones, but we try to keep up. And another thing is the data. We, we keep getting more data coming back um, and living all of them is possible and very expensive. So we look at the semi-supervised learning. Um, again, this is a paper really, uh, really cool and um, published this year. If you have 10% uh, of the data labeled with their proposed semi-supervised learning procedure, that's a green line, it achieves slightly better results performance compared to you give it four training set with four labels that, that basically mean like you not necessarily need to label all your data um that's pretty cool um and br briefly so what's the framework is about and um, the self-training, basically contrastive representation learning is really booming out and pre-training, a lot of people are using self-training uh, self to get the pre-train weights instead of uh, pre-training the, the image net classification task uh, that's training. So here, this part, again, they use the unlabeled data and do the self-training, self or I call them contrastive representation training, uh, learning. And then you get your get the pre-trained weights, and then you fine-tune them with your labeled data. And now you have a teacher model. Then you use distillation. You have the same structure of the same model. Then now you use distillation, use the output of the teacher to train your um, new model, and this model performs better. Than the, than the teacher model even. So yeah, uh, quite, quite an interesting procedure of training and it works really well. And yeah, this is something also quite interesting if you wanna uh, do semi-supervised learning. Um, as I said, I think I'm gonna stop here um, and uh, hopefully you learn something from this talk. Thanks. Excellent, John Lee. Thank you for that. Again, we've we've had a couple of questions come in, but we're gonna we're gonna go straight through to Jan now, um, who will then take us up to the to the questions at the end. So anyone who's asked a question, look, we will get to them after our final presentation. Um, Jan, are you here? Oh, perfect. Yeah, there. 
So for a final presentation of the evening, uh, we have Jan Zwandowski. So Jan is currently the acting head of AI uh, at CAR. <laughs> Just make sure I get this correct. It's CAR. Dot SW org, which is the new central development uh, company for Volkswagen. He's also worth checking out on Medium as he's one of the top contributors for the Towards Data Science publication. But other than that, Jan, happy for you to take it away here. Thank you so much, Anthony. Yeah, um, thanks also to Rodrigo and Jun Lee for the um, talks beforehand. Really interesting. Definitely learned something new. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to figure out what happened here now. Not uh, presenting the screen. Hold on, give me one second. Maybe, maybe just cancel and, and reshare because it's looking like it's sharing your screen, but it was it's just blank. Yeah, um, just cancel it a little bit here. There we go. So let me share my screen again. Um, right here. Share. Okay, it just looks better, kind of ish, right? Yeah, it looks good for me, Jan. Okay, let's get started, everyone. Hi, thank you so much for um, coming in and joining me today for this presentation. Thank you for inviting me, Anthony. My name is Jan Savatsky. I'm the acting head of AI at the CAR Software Organization, which is the central software development unit of VW. My talk today will be adjacent to computer vision, and mostly about the steps before you actually get into a computer vision project. But before we get started, let me start with a little story about um, Frederick Taylor. I'm, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Frederick Taylor. He is the founder of the scientific management. And what made him famous is he was, first of all, the son of a Quaker family, a very, a very gifted son. And he started to work in a steel production factory. And back then, like 100 years ago, producing steel was an art, right? It was a craftsmanship. Depending how the steel worker felt today, you could get more steel or less steel out of a certain steel block because they would always change their, their ways of actually producing this block of steel. And Frederick Taylor, he was very uh, upset at that. And he carefully analyzed each step that was taken to produce this amount of steel. And then he eventually perfected the method. And at the World Show in Paris, around the end of the, the 19th century, I believe, um, he showed that you can, how you can, instead of gaining three meters of steel from one steel block, you could extend that to nine meters. So you basically tripled the amount of steel that you can get from one steel block. And that was just mind blowing productivity increase. And that set off um, the scientific management theory for the next 50, 60, 70 years. And I see a lot of parallels to the data science universe. So data science in my opportunity today involves a lot of creativity, artsmanship, uh, craftsmanship and arts. And don't get me wrong, I do not want to uh, create those tailor-like um, terrible processes um, that he basically used to enslave to a certain degree so many people who work in the just production uh, industry. But I do believe that the data science industry can benefit tremendously from a framework and from guardrails and how to actually set up data science projects. Um, exactly, so about me, acting head of AI at the CAR software organization. So I do believe that we are currently working in one of the most exciting projects in the entire world. So we are currently a company, we were founded half a year ago um, uh, we are centralizing the software development comp uh, competencies of VW Group. They produce uh, cars like Audi cars, Porsche cars, VW cars. And the basic idea is that we want to create a VW operating system, uh, which abstracts the hardware from the software and which can make it easier for software developers to develop applications and functions for the car. The goal is to grow into 10,000 people over the next uh, four years. And we have been um, assigned uh, a few billion dollars in budget. So I would call it a really well-funded, huge um, startup that we're basically working on. Okay, and for me, as a past, I have basically built up data science and uh, AI capabilities at Karmic before and um, have thought I have also a background in management consulting. And so I really focus on bringing the parts of business case and data science project management together. 
Now, why would we even care about data science and machine learning? Let me share with you how SoftBank, the world's largest um, venture capital fund, by, by far the world's largest capital uh, venture fund investor, um, thinks about machine learning. Let's not talk about the profits or losses, uh, but let's think about the framework. So SoftBank says that they want to invest in machine learning capabilities and why, what's the rational, rationality behind it? They basically look 20 years in the past and there was a point where internet-based companies were valued at a 22, per, 22 multiple and then the dot-com bubble crashed because nobody could really figure out how to generate revenue from, um, from the internet and the, the valuations decreased significantly. But the underlying driver that was driving up the valuations was that the amount of internet traffic, uh, how much people used the internet, uh, grew exponentially. And 20 years later, you see the red line, the amount of internet traffic has continued to grow exponentially, and so has the market value of internet-based companies. And that's the par parallel um, that you can draw to the AI-based companies today. So AI-based private um, companies, startups mostly, are valued at a 17x multiple, and it looks like there could be a downturn in the future. Nobody knows, but potentially there's a downturn of the future. But what's the underlying driver of the AI valuations? It's the exponential growth in data. And if you look in the future with uh, the IoT connections and just uh, the hardware costs constantly decreasing and the capabilities of these hardware um, topics increasing, it's predicted that the, um, in the general amount of data that will be produced in the future will grow exponentially. And thus there will be more opportunities to generate value from this data based on machine learning methods. So I think this is really powerful. And I think also a lot of companies have bought into the trend. So on the left side, you see some data. Um, the Stanford has done a study and has basically analyzed how many people, are, how much private and public companies and also the public and private sector are investing into machine learning and it has constantly grown since 2009 uh, to until a staggering 80 uh, billion dollars or trillion dollars uh, a lot of money anyways <laughs> and uh, then the ada ai the pwc survey from 2019 which basically surveyed ceos from fortune 500 companies says that 77% of those companies plan to start or employ AI initiatives in the future, and only 23% say that they do not plan to start AI initiatives. So it looks like investment in AI is heavy, and it looks like there will be more AI projects also conducted in the future. Now drawing the parallel again to Frederick Taylor and how he basically drew the, the guardrails and um, the framework for scientific management, the PMI is the Project Management Institute, and they have delivered a very good framework, the PMP framework, for delivering traditional waterfall-based projects, right? And they have done an analysis, and those um, projects who followed the PMP guardrails, the traditional waterfall projects, um, only 11% of those failed. Now, if you compare that to how many AI-based, the machine learning-based products fail today, it's hard to gather specific data. There's this rumor out there, which some Gartner employee tweeted some time ago, that 80% of AI projects fail. The only data I could really find to back this up was that about 50% fail based on an IDC study in 2019. Um, but from my experience with talking in the industry, this number seems to be about right. And you see there's quite a large gap between traditional project failure and AI project failure. Now, the machine learning workflow is for every product the same. First, you have to define the business case, then you need to prototype a solution, then you need to productionize the solution, deploy it, and in the end, you want to measure and monitor it. And my talk today is focusing on the very first step, because if you do all those wonderful things here afterwards, without properly defining the project, without properly defining the business case, then it's very likely that your project will still fail, even if you succeeded in those three steps afterwards. Okay, so I'm focusing on the first part here today, and I'll, I'll give a computer vision example also later. Now, how do you need to generally think about AI projects? What's important to me is that you first do some self-reflection. 
and that you think about the status of your AI, uh, the status with AI of your company or of yourself right now, okay? So if you're a beginner, you need to approach machine learning differently than if you're a professional or AI first. On the left side, you see approximately the value that you can get delivered um, of following along this AI maturity index. And this is mostly based on the virtuous circle of machine learning. So um, this is based here. So once you have a product, you have more users, the more users you have, the more data you can generate. And because machine learning is based on data, you can then use this data to create an even better product, get more users, more data. And this sounds just tremendous. Now, I think it's also really important to say that when you want to work with machine learning, um, if you're a beginner, it's very good to probably have a central team that develops machine learning POCs and just get started with machine learning. If you have successfully completed some POCs, you can move into the professional category where you actually want to bring a product into a machine learning based product into production. And then later when you AI first, uh, machine learning is natively ingrained into your software products. And you, with every step you think, um, how can you use machine learning to improve the product? And then you just have purely decentralized teams. What's also important to consider about AI projects is the AI project risk impact matrix. So we can basically classify this project as in high risk or low risk, and then look at the impact as in high impact and low impact. And we have the low risk and low impact project, which I would call solid starts. Those are projects you know, for beginners. Then we have the low risk and high impact projects, the holy grail projects, which everyone eventually wants to land. High risk, high impact projects, and then you also have high risk and low impact projects and those are projects you basically want to never try out. So this is again the connection. So when you're a beginner, my recommendation is to start with low risk and low impact projects. Once you've uh, successfully completed a few low risk, low impact projects, you should move to the holy grail category or at least try to look for it. I'll, I'll give you some tools to, to basically figure out where your project falls next. And then once you've completed Holy Grail projects and you have delivered value with machine learning, then you can also move some of the resources into the calculated bet category, which is basically the innovation category. So uh, if those projects pan out, huge reward. If they don't pan out, no worries. You still have the Holy Grail projects to back everything up. Now, let's look at some uh, concrete uh, ideas how you can actually go about ideating, evaluating, and scoping those projects. So when you want to come up with machine learning project ideas, you can use the first half of the double diamond framework. So first you want to discover as many project ideas as possible. And then afterwards, you want to look at the projects which you deem interesting and then narrow it down and narrow the problem space down, the solution space down to the projects that you actually want to work at. For the um, discovery process, I have found it to be very helpful to use a tool called AI the Game. This is provided by our friends from uh, In the Pocket. You can actually create, it's a literal card game, and it has uh, three different categories. So one is role, another one is tasks, and then the third one is value. And what you do, you basically gather a room of, um, how do you call it, of cross-functional experts. So it's always good to have people from the sales department, from uh, the business development department, product management, engineering, some data scientists, some, some product owners, and get just a wide variety of expertise in a room. Then you assign those tasks, right? So one person can be the CTO, another person can be the COO. Then um, you assign certain values like, okay, we want to, what do we want to do? Do we want to increase revenue? Do we want to cut costs? Do we want to, uh, increase our engagement, whatever. And then uh, you have different machine learning tasks. And then you can basically go through those tasks, like one says style transfer, and then ex explains it and um, in, in just two sentences. And then that person can think about, okay, could this task potentially help me as the, in the role that I'm in and with the goal that I have um, achieve my, my goal in my current position or not? And then if you do it right, you get uh, 20 to 30 projects at the end of the session. And then that's it. Then you have 20 to 30 project ideas after like an hour or two hour long session. And you have had some fun along the way. It's absolutely non-technical. So not all of those people need to know about machine learning, 
but those cards really uh, explain it well what you can do with machine learning and it just provides a stimulus to think outside of the box another methodology that you can also use is design thinking i have personally not used it yet but i do believe it's a good methodology to actually come up with ai project ideas Next, then this is, if you take one thing with you from this tool, then I can just, uh, from this talk is, uh, then I can just say that it's hopefully this tool. Um, it has helped me tremendously over the past three years and I would not want to live without it. So this is the AI project canvas and it is uh, based on the business model canvas um, that was developed, I think, by uh, this Oster guy about 10 years ago. And what you want to do is that you want to create a one page overview over each project and answer the most important uh, questions towards the project. Uh, I will go through each of the, yeah, actually I will go through each of the topics right now. In the middle, you have the value proposition. So here you need clearly need to state what is the value that you're trying to create with this machine learning based project, right? I'm hoping that we eventually get away from, oh, I read a cool paper and I just want to re-implement whatever they have done towards what is the value that could be created by re-implementing this paper. Then next we need to talk about who's the customer. It's very important to think right from the beginning about who will actually use the product in the end. Then another topic I see that is often overlooked in the beginning is how would we integrate it, right? Do we have a, a microservice architecture where we could just deploy our model? Do we have to integrate it into a certain existing software stack? Because all of these, the integration at the end, all of these topics basically depend on, decide on uh, what you, how you approach the problem and the solution. Next, you have stakeholders. Do you need to talk to the legal departments? Do you have uh, POs that you need to talk to? Uh, does the strategy department know about the projects and how does it fit into their roadmap? On the bottom, you have the topics that are often uh, uh, looked frowned upon by engineers. So you have the cost and revenue part. Uh, we need to create the rough estimation of how much it would cost. And then we would also need to create a rough estimation of how much revenue it would bring in. Next, we have on the left side, the data column. What do we know about the data? Have we worked with this data set before? Uh, did we collect enough data? How much data do we need? Do we need uh, labeled data? Um, do we need unlabeled data? What do we have? What skills do you need is another one. Do you need data scientists, data engineers? Do you need embedded systems developers? Do you need cloud engineers? And then at the end, a concrete output metric. So if you can decide, define a concrete output metric, let's just say we want to create, uh, reach 99% uh, map score, then put that in here and that would also help you very much answer the most important question about your AI project. And this is also all you can think about as a circle. I start, I suggest you to start with the value proposition in the middle, move on to the customer integration part on the right side, then think about how would those customers basically uh, pay for this product? How much, how, how much would you have to pay to actually produce it? And then do we even have the data? Do we have the skills? And do we know what we want to produce to actually create this output? Let's make this abstract example a little bit more concrete. So um, I have the idea of the AI audience analyzer. So back before COVID times, but even now uh, through Zoom sessions, I would love to get feedback uh, about my presentation. I would love to get feedback as in how many people listened to my presentation, how engaged were the people, uh, what was maybe the, the distribution of gender, uh, of age, of other topics, other demographic topics in the audience. And I think it would provide a lot of value if you could monitor the audience and then provide audience engagement insights for the speakers and for the conference organizers afterwards. Okay, so that's the thought. I put that in as a value proposition. Then who would be the customers? Well, on the one, cent, one hand, it could be conference organizers. Uh, they could sell it as a feature to the conference speakers or also to the audience um, to give just more data about the, the conference and also to know about which speakers are really good and which speakers maybe are lacking some certain um, audience engagement skills. And then you could potentially also sell it to public speakers. How would you integrate it? I think there are two ways that you can integrate it. You can either do the cloud inference or you might have to do the inference on the cameras that are there at the conferences. 
and that would be then an embedded device inference and that would basically dramatically reduce the options that you have to actually bring it to the hardware. Who are the stakeholders? Well, it's never an easy topic to film people during an audience and to also create, yeah, uh, gather data about the people and then to aggregate it. And then obviously the organizers of the um, events are also important stakeholders because they basically have to create the paperwork that the audience allows it to uh, be monitored. What costs do I imagine? Well, uh, there will definitely be a cloud consumption to basically train the model and work with the amount of data that we have. And uh, then we also have the salary for a data scientist, data engineer for three months. I just, you know, suggested that. What is the revenue? So you can sell it as an SAAS business model. Let's just say 10 euros uh, per month, if ever you want, of every conference, you do a one-off uh, one payment of 99 euros. And then with enough scale, you can actually create a profitable business out of it. And data part is quite tricky. So I'm quite sure that there are open source uh, data sets and open source models out there. They could do some, some analysis of pictures of you know, demographic distributions and engagement and emo, em, 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 emotion recognition. You would have to see how much this, how well this works also at a distance, right? And then we might also need to collect and label more data, which would be very time consuming and very intense. What are the skills that we need? Data science and data engineering and the key metric still defined, right? So I'm not sure how exact the information has to be. If a rough indication is, is good enough, or if it has to be exactly, I don't know, 95% um, average precision score, that we would have to find out by talking to more customers, actually. And you see here, here's on one slide, you have the most important information that you know about um, the AI project canvas, about, about this project. And how does this help you now? So we had at the beginning the risk and impact matrix. And my belief is that the more of those fields that you can actually fill out confidently. So out of this AI project canvas, I think you can fill out seven out of nine topics quite confidently. The output metric and the data metric, those are big uncertainties. But the more topics you can fill out, um, the lower the risk becomes of your project, right? If you can have detailed answers to all of those questions, then it's definitely a low risk project. And if it's, you know, the fewer basically uh, answers that you have to those questions, the more risky your project becomes. Okay, so this is how you can score your projects then. At first you've, you've uh, ideated many ideas, then you created this AI project canvas to the most interesting ideas, and then you can basically map them onto the risk impact matrix along the risk. How do we assess impact? Impact is not so easy to assess. I think we can use the RISE score, which is heavily used in the, uh, the product management community. And RISE is short for reach, impact, confidence, and effort. And it's basically just a way to quantify the, the importance of a product, okay? So reach would be how many customers will benefit from the solution. Impact is how much does this feature benefits toward our current goals. So this is very important. Impact is not equal to revenue. Maybe your maybe your one of your goals is to inc increase just customer engagement, which does not directly translate into revenue, but could an indirectly translate into revenue. And there you have a score between you know zero to three. Confidence: How confident are you that you can actually deliver it? And then you divide it over the effort by how much hours it takes to deliver the project. So for the Rise Score AI Audience Analyzer, let's just say we could reach 250. Um, people. Uh, impact would be quite big because for me personally, the goal is to become a better public speaker and that would definitely help me reach my current goals. And um, for the project team, it would be also reaching their goals of, I think, if everything works out, creating a profitable business. Confidence, I think, is quite low because there are uh, a lot of uncertainties regarding especially the data and then the, um, the customer development part. So we haven't done enough there. And the effort, uh, you derive this effort um, by, I think, using the two um, data, one data scientist and a data engineer, and you have to work for a month or like both of them for uh, three months or for a quarter or both of them a month and a half. And then at the end, you get a score of 0 0.52. And then you can compare the right scores of the different projects and, and placed in your project on the risk impact matrix according to the RISE score, which is important for the impact, 
and then the AI project canvas, uh, the boxes that were filled out on the impact side, on the risk side. Good, this concludes my talk. I hope this helped you a little bit today. I just wanted to encourage you to think about the setting up the right pro the project the right way from the beginning. Um, I also encourage you to think about the AI maturity level of your organization before you start, um, so what projects you should look at. Then I encourage you to use tools like AI the game or design thinking to just come up with many AI project ideas. And then you should definitely use the AI project canvas or end the RISE methodology to assess the risk and impact of those projects. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you'd like to follow me uh, on LinkedIn, Medium or Twitter, you can find my handle there. I sometimes blog about these topics, have less time now, but hopefully I will blog about it in the future again. And uh, yeah, I would say over to you, Anthony, to discuss certain questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jan. I, I really do uh, appreciate that. So I suppose to kick off, I've got the very first question we came in was for Rodrigo. It's from Zishan. He had a question about how much is usable lifespan of industrial computer vision solutions, the approximate inflammation time and the approximate budget? Okay, the, the, the last word was budget? Yes. Wow, okay. Um, well, that's a really generic question, I would say. <laughs> um, I think finding a trade-off between implementation time, budget, and so on, it's... Um, um, at this point in time, I would say... Um, the budget is not necessarily a concern from my point of view. Um, there are several brands uh, really pushing in the right direction. You know, um, I think you can, depending on your application, of course, for um, for the visible spectrum, there are cameras, for instance, for hyperspectral uh, hyperspectral cameras, multispectral cameras that uh, the price goes just crazy. In, in this sort of um, applications, I think the budget is definitely a concern. But for uh, most of the common applications requiring normal cameras, I would say um, you can rely on the, on the manufacturer to, to have some good advice. And I think uh, sometimes in the order of of weeks, you, you can have a good implementation. So, uh, with a reasonable reasonable uh, budget. So, does that more or less answer the question? Yeah, I, look, I, I was expecting a kind of rough answer until we kind of have a rough idea of the project, really. Um, so we've got two more questions for yourself, Rodrigo. So the next one is from Farshid. So he said, uh, "Do you have any tips and?" comparisons of stereo or slash depth for cameras for stereo or depth cameras yes uh, that's a that's a really good question it again uh depends on your application for instance um the stereo cameras which is actually the the most common or the most uh, uh let, let's say um yeah, classic method to extract depth information. Uh, it started, uh, yeah, I would say back in the early 90s or even before. Requires, uh, first of all, requires a richer um, a scene in, in, in the sense of, of uh, texture rich scenario, you know, um, because of the way you extract depth from the scene, you actually really need to have a lot of features in your scene. So if you have a, a more challenging scenario in this sense, I would go for, for a depth camera, for a time of flight camera, for instance. There are uh, more commercial uh, time of flight cameras. Uh, there are more industrial ones. The, the companies I mentioned, um, like Basler, they develop their time of flight cameras. Usually the resolution is uh, smaller we're talking about BGA, um, but definitely the, the performance is quite good. So I would say the short answer is that depending on your application, but 
I would say the 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 first the, the most distinctive way is like how is the scene you're looking for, you know? Um, if it's more richer in this sense, go for um, for a, a stereo a stereo set, a stereo uh, a stereo vision system. If not, you can go for a time of flight camera. It will also depend on the availability of the interfaces, for instance. This is also something common. If you want to extract depth information uh, with a low budget, I would say go for a, um, a stereo vision, a stereo vision set. It will also depend on the budget as well. Uh, the resolution you're expecting to get, um, the depth, uh, of your working um, space. And there are, there are several characteristics, but keep in mind that the way one works, one extracts the depth information and the way the other one extracts the depth information. One is by um, receiving the, the, the signal that is bouncing in the, in the scene and uh, basically measuring the time it takes to get back. And the other one is by extracting the visual information based on features. Thanks, Ed. Um, we'll go one, one more question for you, Rodrigo, before we move on to Jun Lee's question. Uh, this one was from Arun. Um, he asked, can you give any more information on line scan cameras? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the, let's say that the main difference to, to start uh, tackling the topic, uh, the main difference between line scan and area scan cameras an area scan camera is the common camera we all we are all familiar with, with a rectangular, um, with a rectangular shape, uh, image sensor. The way you um, the way you talk about resolution in a, in a common rectangular shape sensor is uh, just by defining the, the the height and the width, and, and that's all. Um, the way a line scan camera works is just like one single slice of pixels and nothing more than that. You don't have basically a height in this sense. It's like if you just have one single slice. Um, usually the, the resolutions we are talking about here for the resulting uh, image is quite higher than with an area scan camera. Um, it has a specific niche of applications, the line scan ones. Uh, I would say um, high speed, um, um, high speed applications where you need to, to be um, checking, for instance, inspecting the quality of a certain good, you know, as I was mentioning, let's say uh, labels, you're printing the labels of, I don't know, of bottle of bottles of water, for instance. So the production is like, let's say 100 bottles per minute. I don't know. Yeah, but there are really one label after the other, one after the other. The thing is that this line this camera is going to be pointing towards the scene and it's going to be collecting the images in a transversal manner. So if the, if the conveyor is passing in this direction, the camera is just going to be watching one straight line here in an orthogonal, in an orthogonal way. And then the system itself needs to collect a certain amount of data per time. So it takes like several one slice images, then it collects it and then it retrieves it. So it's, um, it's needs to, this whole process between data acquisition, um, collection of the data, and then to deliver the data actually is not only, uh, it's actually uh, powerful, power consuming, and uh, you really need a lot of resources. First of all, then uh, another thing is that in order to illuminate the area and to synchronize the illumination of the area with the camera uh, acquisition, with the image acquisition, you need to count on another uh, system to measure the rate or the speed at which the labels are passing through. So you, you require, for instance, in that sense, um, uh, an encoder, um, an incremental in encoder, for instance, to be synchronizing the, the data acquisition 
and to be synchronizing also the light, you know? So, because otherwise, if you don't have all these systems synchronized, the resulting images are gonna be blurry. Or let's say that you're acquiring the images exactly in the point where the labels, the label was not on top of the camera. So you end up with, a, with an empty image. So there are a lot of aspects to consider in this sense. Nonetheless, is the most common um, uh, the most common camera used nowadays and since a lot of years for this sort of inspections, you know, for for production inspections. So that's the difference. Excellent, Rodrigo. Thank you. We do have another question that has come in, but we'll we'll try and get through as many as we can before coming back. Uh, so. If anyone wants to keep them coming, we'll try and answer them uh, as many as we can before we finish up. So the next one's for Jun Lee. It's from Jelavish. So Jelavish has said there is a startup from Drishti, uh, sorry, a startup called Drishti, which are offering a very similar service to what you presented on. They've done a 10-week project with Hella. They stated that their results were pretty impressive. Have you ever heard of that company? Actually, not. <laughs> okay. But I'm definitely going to pick that out. Cool. Second part to that same question is the direction of hand movement, is it important? And if yes, do you use something like optical flow? Um, the hand movement is kind of causing issue, but we try not to understand the movement of the hand um, because we just want to verify whether your hand is inside and grabbing the box. So the movement inside the, uh, the, the motion, like the optic flow is not helping from that perspective, but the movement of the hand because of the resolution of the image actually causing issues because your hands are blurred. Um, so short, um, we are not using optical flow. Excellent. Um, next question for yourself, Julie, it's from Irina. Uh, she's asked, have you applied in production any models trained in a semi-supervised manner? Very good question. Um, that depends how we define semi-supervised. Uh, if we define semi-supervised with using unlabeled data, then yes, because these days you can do um, contrastive representation learning then without training, uh, without labels on a big data set and you can use that pre-trained model for fine tuning. In that sense, yes, we used it before. But we haven't tried the last paper that I showed with the three stage with the distillation. Excellent. Um, just, just one quick one there, Junli, before I move on to some questions for Jan, Jan if, he's, if he's available. Um, Akshay has asked, would he be able to get in contact for you? If anyone wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Um, email then. Uh, I will answer. I will put, put my email address into the, the chat. Excellent. Um, so we'll just jump on to some questions for yourself, Jan. Uh, so the first one from Daniel. So does AI Project Canvas propose a selection of AI technologies for a certain project type? For example, whether you use an attention network instead of RPN. So for example, a shopper wrist angle detection in a virtual shopping mall. Okay, um, yeah, very good question. And no, absolutely not. So the AI project canvas is supposed to be very generalistic and it's supposed to help for every um, project that you could basically think of. And it also forces you as a data scientist to step, take a step back, right? So before going into the technical details, as in how you would solve a certain problem, let's really just make sure we have defined the problem correctly beforehand and then enter the solution space, okay? So that's why intentionally, we do not want to look into what, what models we definitely need um, because that's too far ahead. We just want to get the very basic, the very foundation of every project done at first. Perfect. Another one for yourself, Jan, from Irina. Uh, she asks, would you explicitly, explicitly address risks in the AI project canvas? And she points out she thinks it's an excellent idea. 
Okay, I'm glad that, I'm glad that you like your own idea. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, no, I actually also thought about adjusting it a little bit. So the AI project canvas, I think, can be adjusted a little bit for internal projects versus then uh, for, let's say, startup projects. But I would not explicitly include risk. I, for me, risk is the sum or the combination of the answers that you have to the other questions. So risk basically follows from, for, from um, filling out the AI project canvas. Excellent. Um, question for yourself, Jan, from Jalavish here again. Uh, as a side note, she said, when you mentioned the steel market, she remembers that Clay Christensen starts his book, The Innovator Dilemma, with how disruption happened in the steel market. It was a very fun read. Her question is regarding the value proposition part of your AI canvas in the business model canvas Osterwalde uses another canvas, which is Value Proposition Canva, which is very focused on customers and the product. Can you please explain more value proposition sector in your section based on product and customer? And then additionally, how much do you think the data scientist has to or can be involved in this product part? Yeah, um, very, very good question. So. I think the business model canvas was developed first and then later the value-based product canvas was a more stripped down, more focused version of the business model canvas. Uh, I do think that the value proposition is just one part in creating the AI project canvas, but it's, to my opinion, the most important part. Um, so I haven't thought about actually creating also like an AI value-based canvas, but that might be an interesting follow-up idea. Thank you for bringing that up. And then the second question was, exactly if a data scientist should be involved. I think it's absolutely necessary and 100% mandatory that a data scientist understands the value proposition. Because if you are a data scientist and you do not know exactly why you're doing what you're doing, you will not be able to optimize towards the right topics. I do not see data scientists or employees in general as just... Um, the key output metric optimization machines, you have to understand the context that you're in. Maybe you can get help, right? So the AI project canvas doesn't have to be filled out completely by a data scientist. And I think it should be filled up by a cross-functional team, but the data scientist at least has to inherently understand the value proposition. Otherwise we will probably not create much value. Nice. We have another question for you, Jan, on the, uh, the area of risk is like, would you have any examples of each risk area in AI if we are starting to build product at individual levels? Mm -hmm. So the biggest risk that I usually see is um, not knowing about what data you have. So that's on the technical side, right? So the biggest risk is always not clearly defining the business problem, but then on the technical side is just very risky when you have, when you A, don't know what data you have and if you have data, and B, if you haven't worked with the data before. If you know that you have a, a data set with user profiles, with demographic information, it will be a very easy game, very fair game, right? In the automotive industry, we know what data we will get from the cars. And so it's not, we, we know that we can work with this data. So understanding your data, if you have a good understanding of the data, that lowers risk dramatically. If, if it's the first time that you ever work with this data and if you have many question marks, if you even have the data, I would almost immediately put it into the high risk category, just speaking from experience. Excellent. I just wanted to say, Irina uh, wants you to know, she does like the AI project canvas idea. It was maybe my uh, accent that, that came across. Um, Rodrigo, are you, are you still there? Yes, I am. Of course, I was just answering one of the questions. Like, I was, I was typing my answer. I may, I may be possibly asking the same question here. So it's a question from Daniel. Yes. Said, Great slides. Practical mm -hmm. advices on machine vision hardware, depending on computer vision algorithm feature. Thank you. Um, he was asking, have you ever worked with Cognix cameras, mm -hmm. and what do you think of them, especially compared to listed state of the art cameras in terms of S and N? Um, yeah, I was actually, uh, I will basically read what I wrote. <laughs> it's, uh, well, thanks a lot for your words, indeed. Um, I have worked with Cognex uh, a long time ago. It's uh, actually one of the of the brands that have been in the market for, for, for so many years. I have seen them in so many exhibitions regarding uh, 
systems for, for packaging, uh, for security, for control systems, for a bunch of stuff. I think um, the whole package they offer, um, not, only the, not only hardware, but also the interfaces, uh, connectors, and, and the software, I think it's pretty straightforward to work with. To be honest, I don't know about, for instance, the trade-off between price and performance because I, I was not the one choosing those cameras. Um, but I think uh, it's definitely a, a, a good solution, uh, like a single key solution, so to say. Um, so yeah, the, definitely um, if a drug company they are considering them, I would say give it a try. Nice, thank you. Um... This question from Akshay, he doesn't say who it's for, but he said the parameters explained for camera selection, um, I guess it could be you, uh, the parameters explained for camera selection processes will hold good when use cases in the wild, such as front looking cameras in automobile. Front looking cameras in auto, so, so maybe he means like the, the cameras that are installed like in the front bumpers, to, for yeah, I guess when he says in the wild, it's it's a fresh, fresh production environment, maybe. Okay. I don't know. Actually, if if, if maybe you have a oh yes, he does. He, he means he means a fresh production environment. So how do you how do you explain the parameters for camera selection if you're going into a fresh production environment uh, in the automotive industry for front-looking cameras? Well. Uh... I think uh, the the tuning of parameters uh, actually apply for, I would say, for any situation. Um, definitely. I mean, um, the more you get into the into the hardware, into really the 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 intestines of the camera and everything, um, uh, the more you see that um, those parameters are completely necessary for whatever application you have in mind. Um, but I think my, my, my best advice would be um, try to, to consider, again, all the possible implications, all the possible things that might go wrong in terms of um, your lightning system, in terms of uh, noise, in, everything you can imagine and uh, go first of all to the to the image sensor that's uh, that's something that will actually um, help you a lot and will avoid a lot of headaches so um, actually there was also another question I saw somewhere there um, about going a little bit deeper into the camera parameters and some firmware of the Yes, that's that's from Pierre. It's he asked it out in multiple, yes, multiple uh, instances. So yeah, he asked about how do you go and choose your parameters uh, and more details about the lenses and the lens choice. Yeah, I didn't I didn't went to to it because of the the lack of time. I mean, it's a huge topic, but definitely there are some other parameters. Uh, most of the manufacturers again like uh, a light vision like. Uh, uh, Teledin, Dalsa, Basler, and so on. They have improved their their frameworks. They have improved their SDKs and so on. They were buggy, yes, of course. There were like a lot of software in the market, but I I I think I totally um, uh, suggest using them. For instance, some other parameters I never mentioned, like the exposure time, extremely important the gain, extremely important, um, all those sort of things. Maybe in the future we can talk more about that or you can just go to the links I, I posted and uh, so you can see more about it because uh, we, we have just uh, uh, a limited time. So, um, so just one question slash request for Jan from Jellavi. She was wondering, would it be possible to be involved in developing one of your AI canvases uh, for fun? Um, look, maybe what's what's the best way to reach out and ask ask that that request? For sure, um, 
So we're expecting I'm going to be a father soon. So my time is going to be even more limited, but I also love to collaborate on certain ideas like this. And yeah, just reach out. Best way to reach me is uh, LinkedIn. Um, it's always good if you write a, a message in the connect request on why we're connecting. And then let's see if we can basically talk through certain ideas of how we can expand this. I also haven't adjusted the AI project canvas in over a year. So I think it might even be due for a, a little revamp. But yeah, please reach out for sure. Nice. There you go, Jalavish. Hopefully uh, you can get connected. Um, we have two questions. One just came in, but one's been there for a while. It's from a, an attendee who, who hasn't left a name. She said, they've asked, which intermediate projects would help build a stronger understanding towards computer vision? Uh, so for example, if you're looking to do your master thesis topic in this area. I suppose that's an open question for Rodrigo, Jan, John Lee. Um, maybe, maybe there might be bias. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can just start. Just my perspective might be a controversial one, but obviously neural networks and convolution neural networks are a state of the art for computer vision. So that's really important to understand those. But if you're writing your master thesis, I would encourage you to actually do a comparison of traditional methods for a very specific use case uh, with machine learning. So it's going to be hard because you have to understand two totally different theories, but uh, it, it, like you wouldn't believe how often people always jump to neural networks when certain Kalman filters or other traditional, more traditional methods would do the job probably even better and much quicker. So just understanding the traditional computer vision methods together with neural networks and state of the art, convnets and whatever new cool stuff might come out, I can just encourage you to do that. I totally agree with Jan. <laughs> Let me add, add something really quick. Uh, I think for a master thesis, I think uh, something more related with an application would be good, would be definitely good. And yeah, definitely. Convnets are everywhere, you don't, Sometimes you don't necessarily need to apply the, the, the top state of the art, like um, architectures like uh, Jun Lee mentioned, which are fantastic, but at some point you need some expertise to under, to really deeply understand what's going on under the hood. So yeah, comparing some um, uh, algorithms uh, with things that are not the state of the art, like in my very personal case with uh, uh, control theory, there were a lot of a lot of new suggestions coming up like every month, and they were all comparing them against uh, uh, a, a PID controller. And most of the time, the PID controller was performing better. You know, so yeah, definitely, I I agree. Well, <laughs> maybe I need to propose something different here. No, I totally agree. Actually. Um, it's it don't really need a hammer for you know not something that like, like a nail um the um, with a master i always every time when i when I, someone come to me say they want to do a master project uh with me i will ask them what's you what do you want after your master's thesis do you want to do a research i mean do you want to go continue on research direction or you actually want to get a job in certain area I guess if you do want to um, go to the research direction, then you probably pick the most cutting edge, which currently probably is the neural network direction. But if you do want to just uh, for for um, job purpose or yeah, you know, it's it's more like you should align yourself with the certain areas that you want to work in the future, and then as I said that you find a good application and do the applied part instead of the technical or theoretical part of the poking. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, look, I think that's that's going to do us uh, for, for tonight's event. Uh, first off, I want to thank Rachel for being our sign language interpreter. Rodrigo, John Lee and Jan for your fantastic presentations. Um, I want to use this opportunity to thank all the attendees for taking the time to attend an event, particularly after work when you're working from home all day to say a happy Christmas and a happy holidays because most, most likely I'll be speaking to everyone uh, after, after December. 
and um, I look forward to doing a lot more events like this over the next year and I look forward to getting some going in person again uh, which that will be really nice but uh, thanks everyone uh, this is the, the soda.ai computer vision in production webinar um, I'm signing off it's Anthony thank you thank you all <laughs> thanks stay safe